Okay, here we go. Alexander Tanos is our next speaker of the Free Your Mind Conference. He is a musician, educator, composer, and ethnomusicologist. He holds four degrees in music theory, composition, music education, and ethnomusicology. Say that five times fast. He has taught at Columbia University and is a frequent guest lecturer at universities, institutions, and museums. As an ethnomusicologist, he has conducted fieldwork for 17 years in over 40 countries around the world. For the past eight years, he has been researching the therapeutic and esoteric properties of sound from three different perspectives, Western scientific, Eastern philosophical, and shamanic societal beliefs to gain a deeper understanding of how and to what extent sound has been used to affect human consciousness. This search has led him to the intersection where art, science, and spirituality meet. The wonders of sound. His ethnomusicological, and I'll say that one five times fast, approach entails a social scientific study of sound use in several traditional contexts, religious, spiritual, holistic, and cultural. For various purposes and occasions in entertainment, worship, meditation, and rituals of healing and trance, consequently, his approach in researching, understanding, experiencing, transmitting, and working with sound has always been based on multidisciplinarity. That's another one. Without further ado, Alexander Tanos, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So, hello. We just arrived, actually, just two minutes before it started. So I'm very excited to share this uh, information with you. Um, this is something that will take me several hours to expand. So it, this is going to be an introduction, and I wish we have ample time to go into the details because the magic is really in the details. Nonetheless, you're going to get a glimpse of the complexity of the material that I'm going to be talking about. I know everybody loves music, but if we only know that what we know about it is just the surface, and it gets very, very weird and fascinating. So, without further ado, we're going to start uh, with the talk. Please keep in mind that um, this is years of research. It's based on fieldwork in many countries, 12 years of higher education training, and years of studying music. But most importantly, um, it's also based on uh, experience sharing from people. So this is not all coming from me. It's coming from, I've worked so far with over 8,000 people um, doing sound therapy. And I've gathered uh, close to 900 emails of anecdotal data, incredibly important. So it's based on very, very thorough um, research and, and uh, analysis. And the research continues. So. He is one of our heroes. <laughs> if you want to understand the universe, think energy, frequencies, and vibration, Nikola Tesla. Uh, many of you know about his work, but a lot of people don't know exactly what he's invented. So he's invented a bunch of different things. Alternate current, wireless communication, the modern electric motor, neon, remote control, cellular technology, basic laser radar technology, star war tactical technology, x-rays, and so on. Thank you. Um, and sound is definitely frequencies and vibration and has something to do with energy or can help generating energy. So I'm going to first address a bit how important are mathematics in nature and how much we deal with them. So we start with fractal geometry. Some of you may be familiar with this concept. Fractal geometry is a branch of mathematics concerned with irregular patterns made of parts that are in some way similar to the whole, e.g. twigs and tree branches, a property called self-similarity or self-symmetry. Unlike conventional geometry, which is concerned with regular shapes and whole number dimensions, such as lines, one-dimensional, and cones, three-dimensional, fractal geometry deals with shapes found in nature that have non-integer or fractal dimensions. 
Fractal geometry developed from Benoit, uh, Benoit Mendelbrot's study of complexity and chaos, chaos theory, that is. Here are some examples. This is what's called the Mandelbrot set. And here's a short video that would exemplify what happens when we start scrutinizing into the deeper and deeper level of complexity that goes to infinity. I wish the screen is bigger. So you get the idea, I don't want to lose you. <laughs> Another order of mathematics, the Fibonacci sequence. Um, Fibonacci sequence is a sequence of number with surprisingly useful applications in botany and other natural sciences. Beginning with two ones, each new term is generated as the sum of the previous two. One plus one equals two, two plus one equals three, three plus two equals five, and so on. The 13th century mathematician Leonardo of Pisa, born circa 1170 and died somewhere after 1240, also known as Fibonacci, discovered the sequence but did not explore its uses, which have turned out to be wide and various. For example, the number of petals in most types of flowers and numbers involved in branching and seed formation patterns come from the Fibonacci sequence. The ratio of any two successive, number, uh, successive terms approaches the value of the golden ratio as the terms become large. Here's a nautilus, and here's a way of how these ratios were. One and one are in the center, and then two and so on gets bigger and bigger. This is also these patterns and formation are based on Fibonacci sequence in sunflower. This is basically what you're looking at. And this is another example. Next, mathematical patterns that we find. This is something that maybe some people know about, but lot don't. Cymatics. Cymatics is a study of visible sound and vibration, typically the surface of a plate, diaphragm, or a membrane is vibrated and regions of maximum and minimum displacement are made visible in a thin coating of particles, paste, or liquid. Different patterns emerge in the excitatory medium depending on the geometry of the plate and the driving frequency. Cymatics were discovered by Ernst Kladny, 1756 to 1827, who was a German physicist and musician. He is sometimes called the father of acoustics. And here are some examples of geometric patterns. Now, please keep in mind that specific frequencies uh, would give you this formation, but it's not just the frequency, it's based on other value variables. This is what people who know about cymatics don't know. Um, that what are some of the variables? Well the size and the diameter of the plate, the thickness of the plate, the temperature in the room, the humidity in the room, the type of materials being used, and so on. Please don't think that every frequency will have this pattern all the time anywhere. So it's important to be specific. Here's another. Now these are liquids and uh, in, in a recipient full of uh, water and sometimes alcohol and a light spotlight shining from the bottom. These images, the following few images, come from an amazing book by Alexander Lauterwasser, or Lauterwasser, he's German. And uh, they also exemplify what frequencies can look like. And another thing to keep in mind that these are three-dimensional, not just two-dimensional, so it's great to see them in liquid because there's depth. So it's, it looks like, almost like a hologram maybe even hyperdimensional too, who knows? <laughs> Look how amazing and complex that is. Here's some more. And this is something that some people have been working on, which is a similarity between certain cymatic patterns. This one is, um, 1821, uh, I mean, uh, uh, 1021 hertz. This is 2041 hertz. So look at the uncanny resemblance between cymatics pattern and uh, tortoise shell. And <coughs> these are the 
the, the, the 12 half steps of the scale. Crop circles. These, the next few images come from Freddy Silva's amazing book, Secrets in the Field. Some of you may have noticed the resemblance between these cymatics and mantras, uh, I mean uh, mandalas, which are present in many different cultures, American Indian, African, Irish, Haitian, and so on. Now it gets interesting, <laughs> even more interesting. Harmonic overtones. An overtone is any frequency higher than the fundamental frequency of a sound. The fundamental and the overtones together are called partials. Harmonics are partials whose frequencies are integer multiples of the fundamental. These overlapping terms are variously used when discussing the acoustic behavior of musical instruments. When a resonant system such as a blown pipe or plucked string is excited, a number of overtones may be produced along with the fundamental tone. In simple cases, such as for most musical instruments, the frequencies of these tones are the same as or close to the harmonics. The human vocal tract is able to produce a highly variable structure of overtones called formants, which define different vowels. Mathematicians call them the harmonic series, musicians call them overtone series, and physicists, acousticians who study uh, sound and its behavior, call them partials. So basically, um, this is a string vibrating. As it vibrates as a whole, it vibrates at the same time in divisions of two and in divisions of three division of four, five, and six to infinity. Every time it vibrates, it brings out a harmonic. So the string, as it's vibrating as a whole, generates a fundamental frequency. Let's pretend it's a string bass uh, string, or it's a violin or a guitar. You pluck it, and you get the fundamental frequency. Let's say that fundamental frequency is C. And then when you, uh, if you're able to measure uh, these overtones using electronic equipment, uh, computers, software, because you won't be able to hear these overtones which are found in every sound that we hear. Except most of the time the fundamental frequency is very loud to an extent where it overshadows the overtones. When you use electronic equipment, you can see actually the overtones and I'll demonstrate that later and I'll play examples. Only when you play instruments that are called overtone emitting instruments such as gongs, uh, Himalayan singing bowls, the jeridus, uh, overtone singing that you start to hear the overtones. I'm going to demonstrate uh, uh, overtone singing so that you, you know what I'm talking about. So the note that you, I'm going to sing that's going to be most pronounced is the fundamental. But by manipulating the buccal cavity in my mouth, I will emphasize certain overtones to bring them out. So you'll, you'll hear one constant note and fluctuating overtones, they're weaker, so pay attention to the weaker uh, sound, please. <coughs> Here we go. <laughs> Thank you. My mom would be proud of me. <laughs> and here they are, all in solid colors for your viewing pleasures. Here we go, back to back. Free your mind. Free your mind. Okay. So, once again, this is the string vibrating as a whole. And in the middle, you probably have seen our guitar players here you know, know about harmonics because these are the notes that are, the musician would bring out when he or she lightly touches the string and harmonics come out, okay? So the harmonics come out right there at the nods. So this would be, um, actually I'll explain this later in, a, in a something more, there we go, this is better. Um, so this is the movement of a string, this is the fundamental C, 
this next C that you get, the first harmonic, is an octave higher than the fundamental. For those of you who are not familiar with uh, musical terms, octave is eight notes apart. So if it's C, C, pa, da, 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 that's the octave. <coughs> okay? And then the next harmonic, G, you get two Gs right there because you're dividing the string into divisions of two and divisions of three and so on. So you start with fundamental C, octave higher C, and then a G, fifth higher from this one, or an octave and a fifth higher from the fundamental, another C, two octaves higher from the fundamental, E, and so on and so forth, it goes on to infinity. Here we're looking only at the first 16 partials. But you notice that uh, the, the interval, starting with an octave and then a fifth, a fourth, a third, would shrink. And this ratio is always the same, whether you're starting on C, C sharp, or D, it's always the same distance. And how it works and on, on what, what kind of formula, it's the golden mean, the most unfathomable and important number in nature. The divine proportion, golden mean, the golden number, which is 1.618033, no, 1.618033398 to infinity. That many of the ages we're familiar with, and, and including a lot of artists and um, cosmologists and uh, <coughs> astronomers as well. <coughs> Here they are on musical staff. Uh, if you can't read the music, that's fine. You have the letters on the bottom. So octave lower C, octave higher. This is the fundamental. And the frequencies go up. Okay. So I hope we have audio now because I'm going to play. Uh, do we have audio? They should. Okay. Well... Yes, please. I wanted to play you all the notes in succession. Uh, so. The remote is not working. Hold on. Okay, we'll try it now. Okay, so um, there'll be another chance. Let me go to the next one. Now it gets even more complicated. <coughs> what you're looking at here is the fundamental frequency C and then the harmonic series for <coughs> the first 20 partials. But what I want to explain about is this fluctuating integer numbers on top, plus 2, minus 14, plus 2, minus 31, plus 4, minus 14, minus 49, and so on. All the th harmonics fluctuate except when the fundamental frequency here, C, appears. What does that mean? So this is going to require some explanation. <coughs> so basically, there's something that happened in uh, late 1500s in Europe. Um, scientists back then started experimenting with something that's called the equal temperament, which is the act of dividing the octave into 12 equidistant half-steps. The half-step is the distance between the white key and the adjacent black key on the piano. So the western octave is equal to 12 half-steps. Half-step is the distance from C to C-sharp, C-sharp to D, and so on. Before the late 1500s, uh, the, the octave was not equal tempered. Equal temperament meaning you're dividing the octave into 12 equal half steps. So they're quantized. How do we know this? Because of this fluctuation rate here. Now, an octave is equal to 1200 cents, according to physicists. A cent is a small unit for logarithmic measurement for acousticians. Physicists specialize in studying sound and its behavior. What we did, basically, we rounded off things. We took the distance between C and the octave higher C, which is 1,200 cents, and divided it into 12 equidistant half-steps, which would make each half-step 100 cents. So based on this concept, this is something that took a few centuries for it to be um, adopted and become universal, only in the 1920s that really became, or early in the century. 
But it did give us some advantages. The advantages are basically the ability to transpose a piece of music from any key to any other key, including distant keys. Transposition is the act of moving the tonic, the tonal center. Let's say you have a piece or a song in key of C major, and I want to sing it, but I have, let's say, a tenor voice, and it's too low for me. I would transpose it. I would move the C to a higher key so that it'll be easier to sing based on my vocal range. Um, before the equal temperament, you could only transpose to neighboring keys. With the equal temperament, you'll be able to transpose it to any key without the piece of music starting to sound out of tune. This is something that happened during Bach's time. This is when he wrote Das Volltemperierte Klavier, which is the well-tempered clavier. It's the Bible for keyboard players. Back then, there was no piano. There was a um, harpsichord and organ. But basically, it gave us some advantages, which is transposition. But at the same time, it came at a great cost, which is snapping out of the minute mathematics that nature gave us. So these fluctuations here are how different the notes that are in the harmonic series when you were to compare them with the perfectly tuned keyboard, which means that this G right here is plus two cents higher than a perfectly equal tempered, perfectly um, tuned G on the keyboard or any other instrument. Plus two cents might not be a lot, but it's, it's important, very important to resonance and achieving altered states of consciousness through sound. Some of them go up to minus 14. Minus 31, this is where the blue note comes from. Blue note, for those of you who are not familiar with that term, it's a note that's uh, sung or played flat on purpose by bending the string or singing it flat uh, just to strike a chord, a feeling. Okay? Now, this came from um, African slaves during slavery time, but keep in mind that blue notes are not only found in uh, in blues and jazz and, and, and rock and roll, they're found in every culture. Obviously, slaves back then didn't know anything about physics and harmonics, but it's something that we feel. It, this ratio is encoded in us. All singers, all musicians, when they play fretless instruments such as violin, viola, cellos, and basses, they play in non-equal temperament intuitively without thinking, even though they might be conservatory, conservatory trained for, for many years, they would still sing and play in non-equal temperament, unless they're playing a fixed pitch instruments, um, such as um, a piano, harpsichord, a marimba, things that you cannot fluctuate, because with wind and brass instruments, you can uh, change the pitch up and down with the embouchure. Okay? So we snapped out of the system, out of the mathematics that nature gave us in the West. All the music that we play based on this. Not only this, it gets even more complicated. So, um, that's too bad, still no audio. Okay, so, well, um, you heard the harmonics, I sang them earlier, so it's too bad. Uh, hmm, because we have an important video with the other harmonics, so I okay, okay, might not be able to do this one. So tell you a little bit about Indian classical music. Um, it's all based on these mathematics that I'm talking about, on resonance. This is a tampura, the most important instrument played in a performance accompanying um, instrumentalists or vocalists, and it's usually played by the student, and it's very easy to play. You just pluck four strings on open. You don't even finger them, and it creates the resonance and the, and the overtones that resonate, and the soloist be it a, a vocalist or m instrumentalist, one or more, they listen to the overtones and they adjust their intonation so that they fit the intonation that are coming out in the overtones emitted by this instrument. Uh, they insert um, a tiny string uh, right there between the, on the bridge basically, between the actual string, a thread basically, not a string, a thread between uh, the string and the bridge, and it causes a little rattling that brings out the overtones. So this is a very important instrument to bring out uh, a good reference as to how much the musicians need to raise the pitches up or down because we're talking about minutia. Huh? A half step has 100 cents. Now, the, the, the Western octave is equal to 12 half steps. Indian music is equal to 22 
they divide the octave into 22 half steps, uh, 22 steps, I meant to say, or tones, let's use tones. The, the, the Arabic and Persian octaves are uh, divided into 24. The Turkish octave is divided into 53 tones. Why? There must be a reason. Human beings are intuitive. They don't need to know about system to create something. We just need time and effort and intention, and we explore things that are in nature. So all of these things, and I can give you more examples, are indications that uh, the, the this, this ratio is encoded in us. This is where we fall back on. All harmonic systems in the world, all scales, all modes are based on this formula that I showed you earlier, the harmonic overtone series. So, um, oh, let there be sound. Mangala. This is a singer, and the ringing in the back Mangala. is the tampura. Great. Okay. So now, it goes deeper. This is how fascinating technology is now, how much it's accelerating our understanding of the micro world. All right? So what we're looking at here, this is the sound of a gong. I've analyzed using um, a specific software that shows me the harmonic spectrum. I don't know if people in the back can see the, the, the horizontal lines. Well, we're going to see a close-up, um, actually. Let me... Um, play the sound. So what you're looking at here are all of these horizontal lines, we're going to have a zoomed in version of it, are the harmonics that are contained in the sound of a gong. And the sound of a gong is... This is a zoomed in version. Now you can see these lines. Every line is a harmonic. This is like uh, we're all peeping thumbs on the sound, really, looking at what sound is. We're able now to figure out what makes sound sound like that. Well, basically, the overtones are found in nature to give any sound that we listen to its own tone color or timbre. Sound is a type of color, too. It's in the same light spectrum, a different end of, of, the, of the spectrum that gives us light. So in the same way that when a painter is painting a sky, the blue is not a standard blue. This blue can be grayish, can be light, dark, and you know. So the painter would have to mix different colors to get that right shade. And sound, all these harmonics are all different frequencies that when you combine them with the fundamental frequency, the tone color becomes different. This is how we're able to tell how um, or, or what a C on a f played on a flute sounds like compared to the same register C played on an oboe. The difference is these overtones are found to certain levels of strengths and weaknesses, which at the end will design the tone color, which would allow you to distinguish one voice from another, one instrument from another, but it's, a, uh, it's based on combination of different frequencies. Most of the time, again, we don't hear the overtones directly unless we're playing an instrument made out of a metal or instrument based on buccal resonance like a, a Jew's harp or jaw harp or the jiridu, which is not made out of metal. But uh, what's fascinating that um, Sub-Saharan African cultures did not deal with metallurgy, but yet went after overtones. In my field work in, in, in Africa, I came across many instruments that are made from plant material, but um, people over centuries found a way to still get the overtones by manipulating plant material, uh, taking calabash or a gourd, punching holes in it, covering the holes with flattened spider eggs so that you get an amplification of um, uh, marimba-like instrument, mallet instrument, that you get an amplification and the overtones at the same time. And you know what they tell you, that oh, we're calling on the spirits, we're calling on the ancestors when they play this instrument that has overtones. Whereas countries in Asia use these instruments in, in what's now called sound healing. Okay, I'll talk about this later. So harmonic overtones are very important for human beings for a variety of reasons. I'm just giving you the surface of, all of the complexity. So, here's the sound again. Mm -hmm. 
This is a Shruti box, and um, it's an instrument that you squeeze, it has bellows and it vibrates reeds inside. The sound of it is a bit similar to the sound of a harmonium, that an instrument that's played in India, accompanying singers who sing kirtans and bhajans, devotional or sacred chants. And this is what you get when you play C, low register C. All of these lines are harmonics. And the sound is... <laughs> And this is what you get when you play a G. No one can possibly imagine that all of these overtones are in the sound, right? You, you probably hearing the, well, definitely hearing the fundamental and maybe the first two overtones. But when you meditate with it and you quiet your mind and you focus your awareness entirely on it, guess what? A lot of the overtones start to come you be start to become aware of them. This is an incredibly fascinating thing that um, I can talk about for a long time, but uh, I want to be succinct here. So this is C and G together. So you're adding new harmonics. And this is how they sound like. <laughs> this is, uh, these are the harmonics in a didgeridoo. Native Indian flute, transverse flute, the classical flute. Notice that it has less harmonics. And my air conditioner. <laughs> it's incredibly complex sound. It's not a beautiful sound. But you see, just to show you, look, if you, s if you really scrutinize how many lines, there are hundreds and hundreds. They're so close to each other that they almost make a, just one big thick line, but they're actually very tiny uh, lines. So this is interesting. So this is uh, one of my Himalayan singing bowls. And what you're looking at here, and you'll hear it in a bit, there are two channels, left and right. Um, first, you will hear the sound of a bowl played uh, when I strike it. And then I will zero in on each harmonic and play it individually, and at the end, you'll hear everything together. Okay, so pay close attention. That's how it sounds normally. First one. Oh, it's not playing video. This is the second one. And then this. And the last one. It's very faint. This is supposed to be video, I'm sorry. It's, uh, I guess we don't have video connection. But you got the idea. So. Mm, it's not moving. Uh, this is, no, I'm, uh, I'm actually, I'm using two uh, remotes, one for the pointer and this is uh, for the, yeah. Okay. How about if we click on the computer, the next next slide, yeah. Escape and then if we click once again, it's frozen. If we can go to the next slide, please. Let's see if it works. Frozen. Can you give me a quick? Okay. 
So I'm going to continue talking so that we won't waste time. So um, I, I started focusing um, on why these harmonics are important, why this level of mathematic uh, mathematics are important in um, sound, and um, how Indian classical music, which is centuries, probably thousands of years old, how complex it is, and the more you study these musical cultures, ancient musical cultures that are still existing to, to this day, I'll only name a few, Indian classical music is one, Arabic classical music, Turkish, Persian, or Central Asian music. When you start to study these systems and find how different they are from the Western system, all sorts of crazy things start to happen. One of the things that you notice is the equal temperament, which is different quantization, different division of octave and quantization along with it, whereas these ancient musical cultures don't have quantized uh, uh, steps and, and micro steps and micro tonalities. Uh, this is the next one. Yeah. All right, thanks. Yeah. All right. Um, so, but what we also did in Western world is that in the 11th and 12th century, two um, theorist composers, Léonin and Perrotin, Perrotin was also a monk, they were part of the Notre Dame, what became known, known as the Notre Dame School in Notre Dame Cathedral in, in Paris. And they started combining notes to pre-existing melody and they found points of consonance. And these notes started becoming more elaborate and other lines became part of it. And a few centuries later, we got what we call Western harmony, which is based on tertial harmony, on stacking up thirds on top of each other. If you want to construct a C major chord, you take C, you skip D and take E, that's your third, and you skip F and you put G. So you get C, E, G, E, C. This is an arpeggio of the C major chord, notes played individually. This does not exist in the world. If it exists, it's only because of the impact of the Western conservatory system through colonization. Not only that, but countries, like uh, Arab countries and, and um, uh, Indian music, they started developing complex of inferiority because they were made to feel that, oh, your music doesn't have harmony because you must be at arrested development. You know, you did not evolve to have harmony like we do. Well, yeah, the harmony that we have is beautiful. You know, we got Bach and Beethoven and, and rock and roll and jazz and, and everything else. But we lost so much. Harmony as it exists in other countries is based on only drone. A drone and then florid exploration of the scale but in a modal way. I'm getting to that in a bit. So we gain something, and this is something that's indicative to what human beings do, that we always make the best out of whatever we have. We always fix it. We always create amazing things, in the, even in the most incapacitated system. So we made a great thing out of it. But we're not aware what kind of jip we have unless we start to study these other stuff. But for us to gain the understanding, we need to deal with physics, we need to deal with mathematics, and, and so many other things that this is the most enriching, most amazing study that I've done in my life. Literally changed my life. I'm sharing with you only the, 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 the surface of this. I wish we had the time to go a lot deeper, but hopefully you'll investigate it on your own. So, sound, it may be the medicine, or what I think it is, but where that's at the level of using uh, engineer sound, high frequencies, um, and figuring out uh, how certain uh, diseases or body um, uh, uh, organs would vibrate with certain frequencies. Now sound is being used to thin out the blood-brain barrier, which is the most secure barrier in the brain that only lets out glucose and oxygen, uh, to allow people with Parkinson's and ALS and multiple sclerosis to receive uh, more medication going into the brain than the only 5% makes it to the brain. So sound can thin out this blood-brain barrier to help people further. Sound now is being used to help people retrieve their memories, people with dementia. Sound is used to stop growth of cancer cells. There are crazy things happening with, with sound. Uh, so it's not just playing a ball next to someone and the person's going to be healed. You know, it's not that rudimentary. It's a lot more complicated. So 
but also sound is used in military application. Sonic and ultrasonic weapons are weapons of various types that use sound to injure, incapacitate, or kill an opponent. Extremely high power sound waves can disrupt and or destroy the eardrums of a target and cause severe pain and or disorientation. This is usually sufficient to incapacitate a person. Less powerful sound waves can cause humans to experience nausea or discomfort. The use of these frequencies to incapacitate persons has occurred both in counter-terrorist and crowd control settings. Sound is also used in mind control, ELF, extra low frequency. And this is a great book you can download free online by Steve Goodman, Sonic Warfare, Sound, Affect, and the Ecology of Fear. Painting with emotions. So one way in which Western and non-Western musical cultures differ involves the construction and use of scales and modes. A scale is a set, is any set of ascending or descending musical notes ordered by pitch and spanning an octave. The first note of the scale is called the tonic, and it acts as the tonal center. Scales can employ different intervallic structures that change the overall sound. This is what we mean when we refer to a, uh, a scale as a major, minor, blues, pentatonic, or, and so on. Usually major scale for most people sounds happy, easygoing, minor sounds sad or romantic. Okay. So songs are composed around the use of any scale or combination of scales. Similar to a scale, a mode can also be perceived as a group of notes moving in a stepwise motion. Notes within modes, however, may be explored in various ways with different combinations and probabilities in a way that would bring out the mode's ethos. This is a very important concept. So ethos is a Greek word referring to the distinguishing character, personality, or sentiments of a mode. Um, lyrics can also have ethos. Poetry can have ethos. If we were to ask a performer of Western music to sing or play a specific scale, he or she might do so in an ascending or descending stepwise motion. However, when we ask a musician from a non-Western culture to perform a specific mode, we would likely receive an improvised melody or fragment that paints an atmosphere and mood. The distinction is important because the concept of mode involves how it elicits a particular emotional state. Modal music thus allows listeners to tap more into the spirit and sentiments contained in the music. This is less present in Western music, with the exception of certain styles. Modes borrowed from, the Greek, from Greek music began being used in the Middle Ages in church music, particularly in Gregorian chants. During the early Renaissance period, Western music depart, departed from the use of modes, though it resurfaced much later on in some areas, such as in modal jazz, blues, and rock. So in Indian classical music, when you listen to raga music, um, it's all about the mode. You may not be able to interpret uh, you or, or ex describe using adjectives how you're feeling, and kind of like sad and blue. It's sometimes hard, but you know it's different. And when people listen to these ragas being played, and remember that ragas are not being switched on from one to another, they, but they play one for an hour, two, seven, eight hours sometimes, but you're supposed to listen in a, in a uh, contemplative way and listening while meditating to receive the ethos, to feel what is being played. And this is why uh, people in the audience comment and do head shakes and hand uh, movements and uh, use stock words uh, and, and expressions to indicate their judicious, attentive, and participatory listening. And they all react at the same time at the right thing. And not just, I mean, they don't comment on the clearly virtuosic passages, they comment on the very, very subtle thing. But it's a matter of knowing how to listen. This is where the magic is. Similarly, in Arabic music, where we have a concept, well-known concept called tarab. The concept of tarab in Arabic music is high level of euphoria, enchantment, or ecstasy achieved through judicious, attentive, and intentional listening or performing uh, music. It is experienced throughout the Arab world during certain performances of classical Arab music given by accomplished and sensitive musicians and experienced by both the audience and performers. Listening to recorded music can also induce state of tarab. 
A stock of words, expression, and physical gestures are expressed by connoisseur listeners in the audience who may or may not be musicians, but have a command of the craft of listening. They understand the artistry involved in the musicians' explorations of makamat, Arabic modes, um, and possess a high level of sensitivity to an understanding of what is being played or sung by the performers. These listeners comment and react to not only the clearly virtuosic phrasings, but also the very subtle, delicate, and fleeting short musical expressions. The musicians who also share this experience rely highly on the presence of these judicious listeners to heighten and improve the performance, allowing them to give more to the audience and enjoy performing to a greater degree. In a sense, participatory listening demonstrates a state of attunement and shared resonance. This is one of the most important performances in the Arab world and one of the most famous in the world, period. Um, a woman, her stage name is Umkulthum, born in 1904, died in 1975. She, had, she came from peasantry, from a very humble family in a distant village in, in Egypt, and poor, really. But with the beauty of her voice, rose to a high level of fame and developed big charisma that she was able to influence the, the, the biggest political leaders, the most successful businessmen and elite intellectuals, the most famous composers wrote music for her, the most famous poets wrote poetry for her. Sh uh, astonishing uh, figure. This is a great book called The Voice of Egypt by Virginia Danielson, uh, written about her. And there's a documentary you can watch that's called Um Kulthum, the a voice like Egypt. It's based on the book, but the book, of course, is more detailed and interesting. This is another person uh, who is still alive, Sabah Fakhri. He's a Syrian. Um, he also had great power of over Hafez Assad, the father of the uh, president uh, now, um, Bashar Assad. And, you know, Hafez Assad, if you don't know how much of a dictator he was, but he was more inconspicuous than Saddam Hussein. You know, this is the type of power that people with great musical ability have even over the most ruthless dictators. Similarly, this performer, Munir Bashir, an oud player, oud is the Arabic lute, um, had great command over, over uh, Saddam Hussein when uh, Saddam Hussein was alive. Uh, Bashir was, uh, he died in, in uh, 1997, born in 1930, died in 1997. Incredible virtuoso musician him too had a huge charisma and a huge influence and authority in a way on Saddam Hussein. So what's happening here? S music, you know, it really does tame the beast. So now we're gonna talk about brainwave cycles because we're getting into something interesting. If you're not familiar with brainwave cycles, basically we have five gears in our brain. Uh, the slowest one is the delta state where the brain is operating on 0 0.1 to four hertz, deep, uh, deeply s asleep and not dreaming. When we're in a um, theta state, which is when the brain is working from four to eight hertz, that's basically a meditative, drowsy, and c deeply contemplative state. Alpha state, a little faster, eight to 13 hertz. Um, awake, but mentally relaxed. Beta state, 12 to 30, alert, busy, concentrating. This is a state that causes a lot of stress. And the gamma state, 30 to 100 hertz, it's a hyperbrain activity which is great for learning and creating. Scientists, inventors, artists often are in this state. But it doesn't mean that we switch from one to another to another to another. Certain areas of the brain might be operating on both or all of them simultaneously. So it's very, very complex. So when we deal with electroencephalography, um, which is a method of measuring and recording brain spontaneous electrical activity. You know, we run on electricity and chemicals. So in a way, we're tripping all the time <laughs> on the endogenous chemicals, the chemicals that our body secretes. Um, I borrow my good friend's phrase, tripping all the time. That's Dennis McKenna's phrase. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, what we're in, <laughs> what we're in, the human experience is a, is a trip that can be modified with sound and with chemicals endogenous and exogenous. And by doing so, we change the transducing effect, the, the, the receiving capability of the brain. And, and this connects you know, to Rupert Sheldrake's theory of morphogenetics and, and so on, which is something that I also incorporate into my understanding of what sound does to consciousness. 
So here are some um, EEG studies that I've done. These are only snapshots. So this is my um, subject's brain. This is the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere. This is time. Activities start right here and they move up, so it's three-dimensional more or less. The blue is no electrical activity. Green is a little more electrical activity. Then red, yellow, and white, high peaks. And on the bottom, you have the brainwave cycle starting with zero hertz going up. All right, but keep in mind, when we work with EEG, we're only measuring the activities, the electrical activities on the top layer of the brain, one of six layers. Not a lot, it's not a lot and to really understand the brain is very minimal. It's kind of like trying to understand how a car engine works by looking and studying the muffler. But it's still revealing quite a lot. Um, so this is her baseline. So she's laying down, wearing eye mask, not listening to any music. So still, one would think that she's relaxed, but no, busy brain, a lot of activities. So I play the large gong, bam, activities flatten. And everything is being measured using microvolts. This is what these lines are. Microvolt is approximately one, million, one millionth of a volt. Okay? So, and tuning forks, open fifth C and G. And now here I'm using all overtone emitting instruments to see how much they impact the brain activity. So it's clear that they quiet the mind. This is a small Japanese bell made from very complex metallurgy that comes from a region in Japan where Zen Buddhist monks have been uh, using an ancient um, technique of metallurgy. It's incredible uh, sounding. So this is loud dynamics, but soft dynamics, look what it does. Now this is not discursive thinking. This is not mental activity. These are emotional states. This is the limbic system when you find in the lower brainwave cycle such eruptions like this without very spiky peaks. This is emotions. Um, so it's, it's therapeutic. It's deeply elating. Uh, Shruti box, the instrument you saw earlier, also quiet the mind. Frame drum, which has overtones as well. Um, it, it, it quiets the mind a bit, but what it, what's interesting here is the synchrony between the left and right hemisphere, aside from this peak right there. So it diminishes a lot. This is probably why drum circle are powerful, because you're, using, you're drumming on a membrane which has overtones, plus the other aspect, which is the rhythmic mode, the rhythms, which are incredibly powerful as well. So here I wanted to test also some things. Um, um, how certain olfactory stimuli that are used in shamanic societies can influence the brain. This is Palo Santo, literally a sacred wood. Uh, it's a type of wood that is beautifully fragrant and aromatic that's used in ayahuasca ceremonies and other ceremonies. So you can see off the charts, a lot of emotions, which can be grounding. So what's interesting is that uh, what I'm finding so far that the reason why well, one of the reasons, there are really many reasons why sound is used in shamanic ceremonies, especially when psychedelic plants are used, is to snap the person out of a baseline, to change the person's emotional state, to quiet the mind, to suggest ethos, to have them uh, riff on certain emotions in a different way that, that can be healing. When you come to the experience with intentions, you can maximize these things. This is something I can talk about for the next five hours, but just to give you bits and pieces of of how and 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 how it happens, but you know it, it, we shouldn't be reductionist with with this understanding. We shouldn't really say that uh, grandmother, the euphemism in ayahuasca, really comes and does the, all the healing. It's a lot more complicated than this. It's based on retuning the brain, uh, allowing the person to uh, find their own resonance, mind, body, and heart, to to uh, reach. Very uh, unique state of realignment, recalibration through sound and uh, plant teachers. So, this is here I'm using uh, orange blossom water, neroli water, also a lot of emotions. So, uh, influenced by so many things that I've studied in the past, from meditation to breathing exercises and holistic practices and, and visualization and my work with sound, I wanted to design a protocol that I can. Uh, share with people, uh, share this knowledge um, in a talk, but then followed quickly by a direct experience, because the direct experience is the one that informs us the most. 
But what's very important is that before we have a direct experience, sometimes it's really necessary to know what to pay attention to, how to go through it. This is something that people don't often think about because we somehow assume that, oh, everybody experiences the same thing in the same way all the time. No. Very often, prerequisite knowledge is needed. This is something that I'm sure of and something that's widely known. For example, when you listen to uh, Indian classical music, you have to know what you're listening to. You have to know how to listen to this specific raga versus another. Same with Arabic, Turkish, and Persian, and no West African drumming, polyrhythms, and everywhere, basically. I mean, same for jazz. A lot of people dislike jazz because they tell you, well, I don't know how to understand it. I can't stand it. I, can't, I don't like it. But when you sit them down and explain to them how things work in jazz, what is... Um, the, um, the form, talk about improvisation, talk a bit about uh, syncopation, about extended harmony, and uh, you know how really things work. And especially if the person explaining this exudes passion and gives example, you know it's infectious. We've all gone through this where we, our older sibling or cousins or friends, talk us into listening to specific artists where we've always ignored because we just didn't have the aesthetics, the sensibility. So this is greatly magnified when you're dealing with a non-Western music system where it's a different level of reality. So I communicate data with people and um, um, show them how these tools are used. And basically, these are the elements that I use in this uh, setting. Mindset, intentions, coming to the experience with intention, creating safe and controllable uh, and quiet setting. Uh, it's going to include meditation as well, breathing exercises, usually diaphragmatic breathing exercises, visualization and guided visualization, verbal guidance to bring awareness, toning and vocalization, working with overtone instruments, and judicious and equanimous listening. Why? To keep them fully engaged in the experience all the time, to be present. Now, they're not necessarily meditating all the time, but sometimes these deep states of meditation, while I'm using overtone emitting instruments, I'll show you uh, <coughs> a sample of them later on. I mean, uh, just a classification. Um, and teach them what to listen for in the overtones, what exactly in it, the, the range, um, the dynamics, the modulation or the beating, the wobble of the overtones, to keep the mind fixated on them. But sometimes they get to uh, uh, segments and areas and in places in the experience where the discursive thinking that's with us all the time, the monkey mind, becomes a healthier version of discursive thinking. This is where they start to find solutions, realizations, and insights on major things happening in their life. Uh, or the ability to visualize purging or to gain strength or gain certain affirming sentiments. Um, so some, uh, I've analyzed a lot of the data that I have received from people. Um, as I said earlier, close to 900 um, uh, emails um, of great feedback and, and um, experience sharing. And these are some of the benefits. Quieting the mind to enable participants to disengage their undesirable habitual patterns, emotional, energetic, intellectual, and physical, to empower positive and cognitive, positive cognitive change, quitting antidepressants and managing depression, uh, considerable diminishing of anxiety and panic attacks to access and release traumas, to bring the self into a state of inner peace and calmness, to establish a state of resonance and attunement with the self, enhancing one's state of presence and self-awareness, to exercise a state of equanimity and no judgment, increasing self-confidence and attention, enhancing one's ability to listen, focus, and gaining attention to a greater level of details, improving dynamics between couples, dealing with insomnia, triggering, and enhancing one's ability to dream. Believe it or not, I had three cases. I like that. We're getting close to the end. So these are, I share with them um, some advanced technique to keep their awareness on the sound, to judiciously listen to overtones, become aware of the space between the overtones, explore the different register of these overtones, observe the varying modulation, the wobble or the beat, the speed of different overtones, uh, notice their varying dynamics, visualize opening yourself to the sound and merging with it, 
contemplate the shifting energy of the overall sound and of the overtones, allow yourself to be completely engrossed in the sound to an extent where anything outside of that which you're observing would cease to exist. This is where you become the event that which you're observing. And there's no more an awareness of the observer going deep into the sound until you reach time-stopping ecstasy. Commonly used instruments in sound therapy, this is generally called sound healing. Now, I have a problem with that term because it's not explanatory indicatory in, in to what is really happening. A lot of people don't know what it means. Something that the sound healer heals them with sound. They just have to lay down and let the monkey mind do whatever it does and the healer would take care of them. No, that's the, the Western version way of healing. Sound itself does not heal. Sound is a tool like everything else. We do the healing, nobody heals us. A healer is someone who helps people heal themselves. He or she may support them, inspire them, give them tools, encourage them, push them, all of these things, but no one does the healing for us. This truth that's being sold is a gimmick and it needs to stop, period. It's misleading, misinforming people, and it's bullshit. <laughs> We've always been infatuated with gurus, and now it's the shaman's term, but our conduct with them is subjecting them to their ego, to further ego inflation. So when they see us revering them and, and expressing extreme um, devoutness and, and religiousness, uh, of course they're gonna feel entitled to own the experience and maybe sometimes they feel like they need to own it because we're really giving it to them and I've seen how people behave with shamans and gurus like they insist like you are you know no you can have you can be grateful you can be thankful but just don't give away your power our conduct is causing them to be subjected to greater level of ego inflation than it needs to be they are humans they can mess up like everyone else so we need to know that the, the ultimate point is to be self-empowered at the end, to realize, to discover something about who we are beyond it's what's being sold. And enough of spiritual materialis materialism and enough of commercialization of great, powerful tools. We do the magic with them, period. So it's sound therapy, for lack of a better term, not sound healing. <laughs> um, so Instruments that are commonly used are gongs of various, various traditions and types, the voice, singing uh, bowls, Himalayan and crystal bowls, bells, metallic discs, chimes, um, reed instruments such as shruti box, harmonium, didgeridoo, tuning forks, frame drums of various traditions, types and diameters, shakers, rattles, uh, rain sticks. Um, these two, shakers, rattles, and rain sticks, are usually used to ground people or to use the rhythmic aspect of music. So something I did not address in full, well, a lot of things I did not address in full, is that um, there are always two categories, the melodic mode and the rhythmic mode. The melodic mode deals with ratios related to frequencies. The rhythmic mode deals with ratios related to time. And in Indian music, Turkish, Persian, Arabic, mm, African, you always have these two main parameters. And it's very, very complex how they work together and how these two different parameters and the various modes and the way they're explored and manipulated can alter consciousness. And if you know what you're doing as a musician and if you know how to listen as a listener, you can both go to places astonishing places, I don't have the time to talk about it, but there are so many things to, to share with you, but I'm sharing the most important thing. It does not mean that the things that I'm not sharing are not important, but there's no room for them, because a lot of the complex stuff, I cannot just throw in a couple of sentences. I have to explain so many different things for you to realize why they're important and how deep and complex they are. So what I promote is a phenomenological and ontological study of an experience. Phenomenology and ontology are both branches in philosophy. Phenomenology is a study of the structures of experience and consciousness. It is primarily concerned with the systematic reflection on and study of the structures of consciousness and the phenomena that appears in acts of consciousness. Some prominent phenomenologists are 
Heidegger, Hegel, Merleau-Ponty, Jean-Paul Sartre, Husserl, Stumpf, Schütz, Kant, Ver, uh, Varela, and Ricoeur, and Reinach. Ontology is the philosophical study of the nature of being becoming existence or reality, as well as the basic categories of being and their relations. Some prominent ontologists are Aristotle, Avicenna, Al-Ghazali, Thomas Aquinas, uh, Gilles Deleuze, Derrida, Descartes, Hegel, Heidegger, Husserl, and so on. So you find some common um, philosophers who deal with both. So um, phenomenological and ontological inquiry, you know, when I address this, I promote people to be really attentive and present because we all observe things differently. We all experience things differently. And my experience with meditation, which I started when I was 14, uh, gave me a lot of tools that have transformed my life, which is how much and to what level to pay attention and experience and how to quiet the mind. So I promote this approach to allow the individual to really have a transformative experience because this is where the great experience is going to come. The facilitator is responsible for certain things, but as far as the experience is concerned is the individual. And his or her participation must be active participation but they need tools and phenomenology is one of them so exploring where is the experience coming from how is it unfolding how can what i'm experiencing be used in a b beneficial positive constructive therapeutic healing and revealing way what am i learning about myself which side of myself is being revealed why and how where does this side dwell could what i'm experiencing be a higher self-awareness self-realization the divine within where are my normal baseline thoughts? Where did the normal discursive thinking go? The monkey mind, a term used in Buddhism. Um, where did the word I know go? How could it be replaced by what I'm, yeah, almost there. Uh, but you replaced by what I'm witnessing in such an effective way. Am I creating this or am I tapping into it, discovering it? Is it the same thing? How could this be more real than reality itself? What is reality? Where is reality? I'm a big advocate of um, Robert Lanza's biocentrism. If you have not looked into his research, I highly uh, encourage you to look into it, which is basically the premise is that reality is a product of our consciousness. And reality is not what we think, and this is confirmed by contemporary physics, and not just contemporary physics from the 40s, that things are not really as they seem out there. Somehow it's happening within. Let's not go there now. <laughs> <laughs> Where is the mind talk coming from? How come I'm more aware of it right now? How are you going to tell others about it or write about it? And so on and so forth. So all of these questions to enhance one's awareness of what is this experience? Where is it unfolding? Where is the word at that moment? How much of my emotions are involved in the word, in the reality that I experience? So this is what I encourage people to reflect on in an experience. So cautionary notes for people who work with sound. Um, I'll summarize it for you. Basically, ego inflation is a big one and not capitalizing on what the sound does to people. When we don't understand when the individual who's facilitating or receiving, they don't understand how sound works and how much is powerful um, and how much their awareness is involved in it, they're going to think that the power is coming from the practitioner. The same way with the shaman. Okay, So this is something that I address thoroughly because I don't want the, the experience to be given to me too because people often are so willing. Because I know, I understand why these things happen because we come from a disempowered place. We come from a conditioned place full of dogmas and false beliefs and unconfirmed rumors and who we, and, and wishful thinking and wishful believing. So we just don't know how to approach these new powerful tools or some not new, but we need to fix our conduct with, 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 uh, with these things and, and to have the proper etiquette. So, um, okay, so be super cautious with spiritual materialism. Uh, think carefully before you exteriorize an experience. Another common thing that people, when they encounter something, a power within them, their higher self, they think it's the outside. That's called exteriorization. And then they start talking about spirits outside of them. We should understand that spirits being as archetypes within us. We are changing the tuning of the brain and tapping in different states. 
That's my talk. <laughs> Thank you.